Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining. Um, I did want to spend a minute of time talking through this choose your own VMware exit adventure blog post we put together because there's this this sort of fun but maybe a little confusing graphic that we put together as part of this post. And um, I'm always interested to hear, you know, what questions the team has or, you know, how this maps to what your actual experience has been. Um, and there, there's a lot going on. So how do y'all read this? I mean, I look at this as, you know, this is trying to come to a solution. And, and I always wonder, you know, do a lot of our customers realize what do they have? You know, have, have they done that real, really good inventory assessment? Good question. And and you're, you're probably thinking about the workbook um, that we put together to help customers do that type of inventory and scoring. So that's a big deal. Um, I think you're right. Customers don't even understand what they've, how much they've got, where they are um, on that. That's a really good, really important point for it. So one of the things that I take away from the graphic is uh, when you start trying to decompose, I, I'm trying to make a decision today because there's a change in the industry with the software stack I use. I mean, at the end of the day, that's sort of the impetus that's driving the conversation topic right now. And so how do I find an alternative? But through that journey, there are a lot of different layers in your infrastructure and your environment that um, all lead up to what the choice is and ultimately learning um, that path is sometimes, you know, a lot of people don't know the choices that the business they're, they're working for has made at various different layers. Those all interrelate to final decision. And then also ultimately, um, how do you deal with the fact that one of the largest uh, software providers in the world or infrastructure on premises has made a dramatic change that is turning the industry completely upside down on its head? And this, you know, go for me, goes back to some of the topics about like supply chain uh, security. At the end of the day, you need to understand your supply chain. You need to understand all of the players going all the way back to the beginning, all the parts and the pieces that lead to the choices you make. In this space, we're talking a little bit differently about physical hardware, data centers, operating systems, the actual application stacks that drive your architectural decisions. And the output of that is, I'm using Broadcom or VMware, or what is my alternative today? But when you evaluate this whole graphic, there are many layers that you should start considering. Like, should I be using different hardware vendors? Should I um, mitigate the potential that a hardware vendor may have a supply chain issue or a security flaw or issue that affects their hardware platforms? What are my choices? And is my business able to accommodate immediately switching to a new platform choice as well as a hypervisor. So the story really starts to peel back the onion uh, of the different layers of your infrastructure and help you to start thinking about all of those different layers. And it's not just a, today the problem is this and we're trying to replace it with that. That for me is what I pick up from the graphic when you really start to dig into all of the different layers and pieces and parts to it. And one of the things that people got used to with VMware is VMware, you could choose your own hardware. It was more flexible from an architecture perspective. And the alternatives, right, the hyper-converged infrastructure alternatives usually didn't have as much choice. For our enterprise customers, right, being able to, to buy different types of OEM hardware is, is almost as important as the virtualization layer. And so, you know, that was an important part of their criteria. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we, we've worked with some really large financial sector services industries and just enabling them to purchase different hardware vendors and not be concerned about the implementation details or the lock-in software stack of those individual vendors. Uh, they're able to reverse auction their purchases and save tens to hundreds of millions of dollars in their purchasing cycle just for hardware. That's just giving them choice in one of those layers and that, that onion, uh, that I sort of referenced there. No, totally. Yeah. yeah. No, no, you're absolutely right. And 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 going through that evaluation is definitely a, a task amongst itself. I mean, looking at the virtualization needs and so on and so forth. I mean, you've got to really just do your due diligence. Oops. Yeah. And it's it's gonna take time. I think, you know, that's one of the things in this graph is you know, if you're looking at a short time horizon, you know, 
I, we're not watching any anybody who can make a decision and swap things out inside of a year, 18 months at best, right? It's it's a really significant effort to make this change. It's why Hudcom's able to make the pricing and, and license changes um, with without a lot of heartburn on their part. I think what's startling to me is that a lot of people are reporting price changes from things that are going from like 60K a year to 1 million a year. And in many cases, like that's enough price difference to hire an entire team and solve the problems that you're originally paying for with those kinds of licenses. So realistically, if you are talking about like time as in a year of waiting to do your licensing change or swapping away from something like the Broadcom licensing changes, you're going to have to go pretty fast or end up eating those costs. That Yeah, that's that's an interesting point, Isaac, because that points to um, one of the elements in the graphic, flexible architecture. And does your environment have the ability to swap um, quickly and, and, and you know easily between ESXi, Proxmox, uh, XCP, XCPNG, uh, Bear KVM, Hyper-V, you know, all of the different uh, virtualization and, and hypervisor solutions out there, having that flexibility in your architecture to make those decisions quickly and in ultimately embrace multi-vendor solution, in this case, your hypervisor or virtualization platform. Yeah, very good point. Yeah, what's, Go ahead. Uh, what's scary to me is that um, apparently the CEO even two years ago had been saying that they wouldn't be doing this kind of price hiking. So we're seeing now that they're walking that back, they're going through and they're doing these almost outrageous increases in price. Do you think that other companies are going to follow suit and treat the software that previously is already, I think, a little expensive for a lot of open source things, but going to like this extreme? Uh, certainly, certainly a possible, um, you know, commercial companies have the ability to, you know, take a, a locked in ecosystem and and dictate structural changes to their licensing or pricing models um and that's a lot of of what we deal with here at rack and is having having the ability to allow somebody to, to make changes at all of these different layers and you know whether it's the hardware platform specifically whether it's you know a dell server or lenovo you know hpe cisco whatever it happens to be that you you're using but embracing new platforms new virtualization, new OS, or, or different Linux distributions. I mean, the shakeup in Red Hat CentOS has made a significant change in Linux mm -hmm. virtual or Linux operating system adoption and directions. And so that drove a lot of companies to uh, either move to Rail to embrace it, which was the reason behind that move, in my opinion, or, or move to other alternative solutions like, you know, Ubuntu or Debian or Fedora you know, the newer emerging replacements for CentOS like Alma and Rocky. Um, but again, flexible architecture, you've got to be able to deploy those different operating systems and solutions. Yeah, I'm, I'm still surprised y'all haven't said the word technical debt yet, Beho, because one of the things that's sort of in all this is paying down technical debt and the idea of switching to some open solutions that don't have big corporate backing and don't have license models requires teams to have a degree of expertise to maintain those systems that, you know, they're already behind in a lot of operational choices. Um, and so, you know, I, I've, I've seen conversations like, oh, just switch to raw KVM or something like that, but not a lot of thought in how much your team actually needs to know to then maintain a system like that or support architectures that don't have all of the bells and whistles that VMware or a Nutanix or a scale would have built in. Yeah. Well, uh, and, and I wonder about that is, is who, who is able of, yeah, I know of a couple of, you know, fairly large companies public about it, but they have entire teams dedicated and they're not, they're not using vanilla KVM. They've got their own fork of it that, some special VM internally, right? So who who's really going to use KVM from coming from a, mm -hmm. a VMware platform where it's more or less batteries and hyper? Well, yeah, and that's that's a good question about um, you know going back in time and, and asking yourself why did VMware become so successful? 
And, you know, at the end of the day, the, the backbone of their success was built on ESXi and things just sort of working out of the box. Um, over time, it became very complex as they added new features, new capabilities, new use cases, et cetera. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you're buying um, peace of mind by buying a VMware license, or that used to be the story, right? So it used to be going back into the 90s with Cisco's you know, network operating systems and switching. You, you never got fired if you bought Cisco, was the story. Didn't matter the price. But you always felt comfortable buying Cisco. This is a very similar story where, for the most part, people always felt comfortable buying VMware. And now, all of a sudden, they're turned upside down or on their ear, and they're not comfortable based on uh, the changes that the acquisition company has made to their ecosystem. They, they had the advantage of VMware having the motion and networking capabilities that, you know, even if most things didn't need it, were always there. And so it, it made it an easy default choice, even if it was a little bit more expensive. I'm surprised y'all haven't, y'all haven't uh, named out the ephemeral VMs, the big vocabulary word on this list, because, you know, the degree to which people have um, the ability to treat virtual machines as disposable and temporary I, it really is one of the big differentiators between whether you can get out of VMware or not. Yeah, and similarly, there's the whole construct of um, virtualization on premises, and if you're making a shift um, and everything is ephemeral, do you go public cloud, right? Or if you're, you know, governance, compliance requirements security and uh, similar requirements require you maintain on-premises, what's your private cloud virtualization stack that you're going to drive towards? And But at the end of the day, there's always physical infrastructure underpinning it, whether you're paying somebody a premium to maintain that in public cloud uh, or you're maintaining and managing it yourself. So um, it's an interesting point. Um, that's more application use case workload issue at and at the end of the day it doesn't really matter then what the hypervisor is driving it as long as you have good controls for that and you can use the right hypervisor with the right mix of um cut you know vendor support um that's a big issue so and that's where a lot of the pain points with people's decision process right now in this specific context of you know broadcom and esxi to what so um, is, you know, price and support and your um, comfort or discomfort with how much of a company is behind the solutions you choose in the store. But as we see, even the largest vendors out there, it doesn't matter. You still don't have a full security blanket with those. But do you think that it's reasonable for our customers to go from 100% VMware to 100% something else? What, what would be reasonable ratios? Uh, I think that's a business specific decision process and that's what we're trying to help with, right? Is, is how much is right to continue maintaining in your VMware stack? What else do you pick up and start driving in your infrastructure? What's the cost balance between those? What's your, um, you know, ability to withstand, um, concerns about your supply chain or your vendor stability or support matrix, some workloads. It doesn't matter as much if they're not as highly available, not as you know well supported a stack. And so, being able to do, you know make those decisions and then also be able to technologically and architecturally accommodate running different platforms is an important problem on its own. Most companies can't do that unless they're running a really good infrastructure and automation and orchestration. Well, well, and in, in like digital, isn't that where? Isn't that where the promise of Kubernetes comes in? Is that it's supposed to be able to repair and run any workload, and you know, and how well has that worked out? I mean, it's <laughs> trying to, to get to the bare metal Kubernetes, and that's a huge problem. And but then Kubernetes actually can't scale. Um, it's getting better, but it, it can't scale and effectively take advantage of it. You know, some of the modern um, server platforms out there. There's just way more computing capacity in there that's being wasted, which means how do you deal with that you create boundaries within virtualization to serve up different containerization you know objects to serve out of and so um yeah but workload and reality sort of have to well, I, I think kubernetes is a real part of of 
you know, all the enterprises we talk to, it's a very real part of their strategy. Um, the, the challenge, I think you're right, is it's a good abstraction, but that doesn't mean that it's easy to run it or maintain it, especially when you're looking at replacing VMware, which is mostly on-premises. So, you know, the operational side of that equation, I think it's something that you're going to have to work through. It, um, and that might mean using ephemeral VMs and you might be able to use open source, but then you have to maintain open source. The, the whole sort of the mission for RackIn is to make a lot of those those layers of the infrastructure much more standardized so that you can mix and match uh, depending on the workload and maybe say, oh, I'm running Kubernetes. I don't need VMware for Kubernetes. I could reduce my my VMware footprint considerably if I'm not running you know, Kuber- you know a, a, a containerized workload on VMware that doesn't need, you know, the type of persistence, storage, and, you know, networking and all those other capabilities. Um, so there, there's definitely opportunities if you if you start thinking of your infrastructure as having to be all from one vendor. Um, and I, we talked about this earlier, and it's not clear that any of the, any vendor is going to be um, potentially a, a, a safe haven um, long term, right? We certainly see this with our customers and hardware where they they intentionally, for supply chain reasons, have multiple hardware vendors. I can see a world where they're doing the same thing on on virtualization vendors and and actually looking at at right sizing their virtualization vendors just to make sure that they they avoid Broadcom V two. Sure, and you take a phased approach and see if there's a technology fit and a budgetary fit and you're able to make those decisions and be able to grow upon those successes. Yeah. I, I am curious why large scale is on. The, what if, what if I am large scale and I need ephemeral VMs? I, you, you certainly could. The, the idea here was that, um, ephemera, if you can say yes to ephemeral VMs, then you have choices that are um, more open, right? You don't need all of the robust uh, hyper-converged infrastructure side of the virtual machine equation. And so so it's not that large scale is you, you know, a prerequisite for ephemeral. It means that if you said, yeah, if you said you don't have ephemeral VMs, meaning you need the hyper-converged storage as part of the solution, then you get into a larger scale with go Nutanix. If you only need smaller scale and small scale can get pretty big, but scale computing is is more um, focused on that side of the market, while Nutanix is more mid and large. And so, so that you you just have you're reading it from the if you're if you're not able to do a federal, then scale uh, is a factor for you. Gotcha. Okay. One of those, yeah, it's a funny thing. You, if you read the, if you read it backwards, it can look like things are in a weird order because they are in a weird order. Um, what do you all think about the ability, the, the subtraction, this idea that VMware, right? We've seen this all the time. Uh, our customers have dependencies on VMware that they're not even aware of. What I've sometimes called keystoning VMware, meaning you assume it's everywhere. You can shortcut like abstraction layers and you, you you just use VMware tools directly. You don't think about having to have a platform automation layer above it. Um, and and that in itself could make you less dependent on VMware. But I, I see a lot of our customers are wired in directly into VMware and, and that, that keeps them from swapping as much as anything else. Do you all see that in our customer base? Well, let's be honest. If, if you're using Terraform, you know, Ter- Terraform claims to support multi cloud or whatever. Mm-hmm. If you've written a bunch of Terraform for VMware, it's not easy to pick up and go go use that for KVM or go use that in AWS. Basically, got to go, you know, re-engineer all of that work. So that's true. Those are those customers are a step ahead of the ones who've been using vRealize automation or VRO or some of the VMware specific tools um, where they they don't even have an abstraction layer that can they can they can repoint. That actually leads into a very good question. If a lot of people built these systems for VMware and they previously had hiring rotations where they lost a lot of domain specific knowledge, 
the new teams are going to have to start learning things anyway. Do you think now would be a good time to pick up new tooling like Digital Rebar to enable that multi-vendor or hybrid-based environment? This is a once-in-a-generation opportunity, IT generation. Yes, Isaac, that's a very good point. This is before you just spend a whole bunch of time chasing down into something new, um, fixing some of those problems uh, and getting the right skill sets is a, is is the time, right? And this is part of, I think, what you're hitting on is one of the things I wanted to highlight in this graph is you could spend a lot of time chasing down, building up open source expertise and learning Proxmox or is uh, Zen or Kubevert or something like that. Um, and that might be a good use of your time. But at the same time, you might find that uh, building in other skills and going up stack where you're looking at infrastructure platform engineering and paying down technical debt and creating uh, abstraction layers above could be a better investment for you. Um, especially because it could be very hard. You know, do you, do you have to figure out where you can find talent and where you have talent? The talent part of the situation is a big one. Is it really a once in a lifetime event though? I mean, it seems like Red Hat changed their licensing all of a sudden. Broadcom changed their license all of a sudden a huge push into Kubernetes. I mean, I remember when, you know, people were saying that, oh, the move to cloud is a once in a life. And and now everybody's trying to move away or large droves. <laughs> right, right. Well, it's like boiling a frog. Everyone gets used to their amazing tooling that they're getting for what the companies are valuing as a lot more than they're actually getting paid for. So... How is digital rebar potentially not going to do the same thing? Is that something we should be concerned about? It, it is a factor of how these tools approach their ecosystem and, and what they build. Um, you know, it is the reason we got into the VMware dilemma is because VMware was providing a lot of value and the consistency at the operational level was really valuable. Um, and that's, I think, the balance with this is that there are, you know, companies do need to make choices about having some type of consistent abstraction layer in their infrastructure. Um, the, the, the deeper the vertical gets, um, like VMware has gotten, then potentially the more risky they become, they be, it becomes harder to sort of swap out the layers from that perspective. Um, but it's a reasonable question that, that customers of ours ask us, right? They want to know what how we're going to help protect their infrastructure. Um, and, and those are, you know, part of the balance in, in all these equations. We do see this, by the way, in cloud also, where a lot of the um, cloud management tools people want to get from a vendor besides the cloud provider um, because they want that distance. And so um, having something that isn't from your hardware OEM or virtualization OEM um, when you're looking at doing management layer stuff, that ends up being a, a solid place to have a consolidation layer. That's really good. We're almost out of time for this. Um, you know, I, I really appreciate the insights insights here. Um, other, you know, sort of a, any wrap up comments or, or closing thoughts for people on this? I think the, the primary thing is, like you were mentioning, maybe it's not like once in a lifetime, but it's definitely sort of a, a, a decade sort of transitional inflection point for people and stepping back. Um, it, I see a lot of uh, customers kind of making a, a knee-jerk reaction of what do we replace Broadcom or VMware with? And and they're trying to do a one-to-one -one mapping without going through this exercise of understanding their infrastructure, understanding the different layers that they need they need to think about where other problems like this can surface and how do you mitigate those challenges and how do you en embrace the ability to make choices at each of those layers so you can insulate yourself from industry changes and shifts like this. Hmm. I think that's an important insight. It is. Cool. Well, I would encourage anybody listening to this, please take your time, read the blog post. Um, Come back with your own opinions, your own thoughts. Check out the materials that we've been putting together as part of this Broadcom churn. Um, and I do mean once in an IT generation, I think not a human generation. Um, you know, Rackin is really committed to this multi-vendor uh, vision and, and autonomy for our customers. 
and self-management. And so, you know, we're really thoughtful and experienced in this. And so we have a lot of experience there that we're, we're happy to share here, but we also have a lot to bring uh, to one-on-one. So I, I hope if you're listening to this and it's helpful, call us up, ask for help, read the materials that we're putting together. Our goal is to make you better able to manage your IT infrastructure. Um, and we have tools and platforms to help do that, but fundamentally that, you know, that's our mission is to help our, our customers be better operators. So thank you all very much. I really appreciate your insights on this and, and sharing your thoughts. And uh, I'm looking forward to maybe doing this again on some future material. Thanks.